Today, few people know of the ultimate journey into hell, a journey made by Jesus Christ himself. It is stated in the creeds, from the Apostles' Creed and on, that Jesus descended into Hades, or descended into hell, as it often is put. On his descent, Christ faces an enormous challenge to rescue souls from hell. Jesus faced an enormous challenge to rescue souls from hell? Hello, Bezel Triple Three. You know, for the Christian, creeds are important. They succinctly compress and summarize foundational beliefs that were created in order to oppose doctrinal errors that were floating around at the time of their writing. The Nicene Creed, for example, formed around the 4th century, unashamedly affirms the deity of Christ and was directed against the Arian heresy which denied that Christ was fully God. The Apostles' Creed, which began as the old Roman Creed, drawn up around the 2nd century, emphasized not only the Trinitarian nature of God, but also the true humanity of Jesus to forcefully oppose the Gnostic heresies of that day. By around the 6th century, the Apostles' Creed, not written by the Apostles, but comprising the essential doctrines the Apostles taught, took on its final and fullest form, and is the creed that confessional churches use today. Now, in the section on Jesus Christ, we read these words. He was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. Jesus, the God-man, was crucified, explaining the way he died. That he died, explaining that he was really dead and not just unconscious. And that he was buried, explaining that his human body, now a corpse, was placed in a tomb. And then it says, he descended into hell. The question is, why, uh, uh, what does it mean, and why did the church fathers think it so important that this phrase be added? One popular notion is that Jesus went to the place of the dead to bring those Old Testament souls who were trusting in the promise of the Messiah into heavenly glory. However, the passages usually uh, cited for this idea, Ephesians 4.8, 1 Peter 3.18-22, and 1 Peter 4.6, really have nothing to do with Jesus literally taking souls out of hell. The New Testament says that Jesus died on a Friday and then three days later returned. So the question was, where did he go? And the story is that he went down to the place of the dead where they were in Hades and wherever the dark place under the earth was and brought them out, brought out the ones who were faithful in the old times to God. He went down and took them from the devil and took them back to God. That was ultra-liberal and thoroughly Gnostic Elaine Pagels of Princeton University, who among other things is the darling of the History Channel for all things liberal. Now let's try to clean up a couple inaccuracies in her statement. First, she says that the story is that Jesus went down to the place of the dead. Where is this specifically found in the New Testament, Elaine? I do know that Jesus, just before he died, said two things that would seem to say something else. He said to the penitent thief, Today you will be with me in paradise. And two, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Both admittedly vague as to where the soul of Jesus actually went, but to the dark place under the earth? Um, under the ground you're standing on is the crust. It's around 6 to 30 miles thick. And although there are underground caves and caverns, I'm quite certain that there are no disembodied souls hanging out there. Wherever souls separated from their bodies go is not a physically located place under the ground, but rather to a spiritual realm. Then there's the idea that Jesus descended into hell to proclaim his victory over sin and death to the souls imprisoned there. The idea comes from one of the same verses I listed earlier, 1 Peter 3, 18-20. But again, the context and time period more likely indicates that this proclamation or preaching took place through Noah himself, speaking by the Spirit of Christ, rather than during those three days that Christ's human soul was separated from his body. In medieval paintings, Jesus emerges from a cave or a doorway, bringing souls with him out of hell. Throughout history, heroes have descended into hell to rescue the damned. In Greek mythology, Orpheus ventures into the underworld to save his wife. 
For nine days, a Norse god rides into hell searching for his dead brother. Both fail. But Jesus succeeds. Throughout history, heroes have disappeared. Medieval paintings, how about referring to the actual text of scripture? Notice how the History Channel tries to diminish the historical account of Jesus' death and resurrection by placing it alongside mythologies of Orpheus and Norse gods. Folks, that's apples and oranges. But Jesus succeeds. The story of Jesus going into Hades, the house of Hades, needs to be seen in the context of other descents into the netherworld. I think there's no doubt that the author intended the descent story to trump the kinds of stories that you'd find in other literature. What descent story? I'm sorry, but as I said before, any passage you try to use in the Bible to make the case that Jesus went to hell or Hades for those three days to rescue souls from the devil are few and far off in left field. I think it much better to understand the meaning of the phrase, he descended into hell this way. The eternal son, the second person of the Trinity, became a man and was placed under the demands of the law and perfectly fulfilled the law. He endured the most grievous torments and sufferings in his body and soul. He was crucified and died and was buried and remained under the power of death and yet saw no corruption. Three days later, he rose from the dead with the very same body, now glorified, in which he had suffered, with which he also ascended into heaven, and there sits at the right hand of his Father, making intercession for believers, and shall come again to judge both men and angels at the end of the world. The Westminster Larger Catechism puts it this way, question 49, How did Christ humble himself in his death? The answer, Christ humbled himself at his death by having been betrayed by Judas, forsaken by his disciples, scorned and rejected by the world, condemned by Pilate, and tormented by his persecutors, having also conflicted with the terrors of death, the powers of darkness, felt and bore the weight of God's wrath, and laid down his life, an offering for sin, enduring the painful, shameful, and cursed death of the cross. And then it goes on. Question 50. Wherein consists Christ's humiliation after his death? Christ's humiliation after his death consisted in his being buried and continuing in the state of death and under the power of death for three days, which hath been otherwise expressed in these words, he descended into hell. Even today, the Christian hell evokes vivid images of gruesome torments, each perfectly crafted to punish the sins of the damned. But mysteriously, as it exists today, the Bible says virtually nothing about the nature of hell's tortures. When you look at the New Testament, you don't see a very developed idea of hell as just a place of suffering and fire where evil people will go. Now that's simply not true. From the Bible, we're faced with at least four sobering truths regarding this most terrible of places. The first is that the suffering of hell is beyond any experience of misery found in this world. Revelation 21.8 tells us that the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for the murderer, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. And two, hell is the presence of God in his infinite justice with no mediator. Revelation 6.16, calling to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. And three, there's no inequality in hell. Everyone there will receive perfect justice. Romans 2.16, on that day, according to my gospel, God will judge the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. And four, hell is never ending. There is no ticket out by repentance or by an end like annihilation. You see, hell is the place where those who insisted on living apart from and refusing to give worship to the God who created all there is are destined to be. Hell is the place where those who lived all their lives opposed to the only God there is will get their way for all eternity. It is a mystery. How did the Christian hell become a place of such elaborate punishment? The truth traces back to early Christian writings banned from the Bible. 
These so-called apocryphal texts were not included in the New Testament. But for historians, they are equally important because of the fact that they give us an idea of what people were believing in the first centuries. It is a mystery. How did the Christian hell... No, these later Gnostic writings were not banned from the canon of the New Testament. They were simply never recognized as authoritative by the early church because they did not have the required apostolic origins and therefore could not be considered as God-inspired. They are equally important because of the fact that they give us an idea of what people were believing in the first centuries. One recovered text, written just 100 years after Christ's death, describes hell in horrifying detail. In the Apocalypse of Peter, Peter has a vision of what is going to transpire in the next life so that Peter can have a kind of a sense of the horrific kinds of punishments that await the wicked. In Peter's vision of the Apocalypse of Peter. You know, this document is thought to have been written somewhere between 150 and 250 AD. So even if you take the earlier data, that would make the age of the Apostle Peter around 145. It's more than doubtful that Peter wrote this. No, Peter's name was attached to this document in order to lend it some kind of credibility. The Apocalypse of Peter ought to scare the sin out of you. Scare the sin out of you? Well, the problem is it can't. The sin in you and me is so deep, so ingrained, so utterly enmeshed into our very being, in both our bodies and our souls, that no amount of scare tactics of hell, or future torments, or cutting off of lips, or fire entering our bellies, or separation from God, or anything else one can dream up can get rid of the sin that lies within us, that, if left untreated, will bring us to the place of everlasting pain and sorrow and despair. When a Christian believes and confesses the Apostles' Creed and says the words, He descended into hell, he or she is trusting that Christ not only died bodily, but that he also suffered the white-hot fury of God's vengeance and wrath in order to propitiate or appease God's infinite judgment against sin. Jesus the Christ took upon himself during those agonizing hours on the cross the torments of hell and the everlasting death that you and I justly deserve. It's in light of this incomprehensible reality that we are to view the prophetic words of Isaiah 53. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was laid the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his stripes we are healed. We like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one of us to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Although Jesus, hanging on that cross, enduring God's infinite wrath against sin, was a finite period of time, the perfect and spotless substitution he offered was of infinite value to the Father and therefore able to satisfy God's wrath. And Jesus, being victorious over sin and death by virtue of his resurrection from the dead, will save anyone from the torments of hell who places their trust in him. 